type of meditation that's not very well appreciated is the practice of walking meditation. And it's often dismissed and just overlooked because we have the idea that meditation is something you do with your eyes closed, seated. And it has a lot to do with our preconceptions of what meditation is. That meditation is a cultivation of peace, calm, tranquility. But that's not what Buddhist meditation is. Buddhist meditation is about peace. But it's about peace as a result of the meditation, not as a meditation. The Buddhist teaching is for the cultivation of wisdom. And it's wisdom that brings peace. So you might say that meditation isn't meant to bring peace, it's meant to bring wisdom. Why does wisdom bring peace? Because of the freedom from the suffering that comes from ignorance. This is what the Buddha realized, the profound truth of his teachings, that suffering doesn't come from our experiences or the world around us. Suffering comes from ignorance. And so he taught us to cultivate understanding, understanding that's based on familiarity, familiarity that's based on observation, direct observation. And so really walking or sitting have no consequence, have no uh, place, they, they, they play no part directly in the cultivation of wisdom. The posture plays no part. Or in other words, the posture, whatever posture, um, works to cultivate wisdom, no matter what the posture might be. That being said, both walking and sitting are enjoined by the Buddha, taught by the Buddha, advised by the Buddha. And it's something that's not really well understood that the Buddha taught us to practice walking meditation as well as sitting meditation. Now, sitting has the benefit of certainly cultivating, leading to peace, tranquility, calm. But again, that's not the goal. And yet it can be used as a tool to cultivate the wisdom. So it is useful in that sense. So there, are, there are issues with it, with it, though. Of course, you can become attached to the calm. But it can also be quite uh, unsustainable for the body. If there's one thing we've learned in modern times, it's that Staying seated for too long is not, not healthy. And so a big part of walking meditation and why the Buddha taught walking meditation was for, for the cultivation or the continued, continued cultivation of mindfulness uh, throughout the day and throughout your life. So one of the most common places where we see the Buddha talk about walking meditation is in, in intensive practice. When the Buddha talks about a meditator practicing all day, he doesn't say they sit all day or they spend as much time as they can sitting. Uh, you think in the Buddha's time, walking would have been much more common than it is today. And, uh, and yet they, there was still an, an appreciation of the need for walking. Probably um, for meditators more than ordinary people because if a person were going to sit around and me sit in meditation all day, it would be uh, unhealthy. But today, of course, sitting is much more common and we're learning that sitting at a desk all day or, or sitting um, driving and, and sitting at work and sitting in front of the computer 
sitting in class all day. That these things are that, that, that this um, has the potential to be unhealthy. So it's not sustainable as a meditation practice. So the first um, obvious benefit of walking meditation is this: that it allows you to continue the cultivation of mindfulness throughout the day. I mean, maybe it's better not to phrase it like that, but just to say it should be obvious that if you're going to practice meditation, mindfulness all day, then at least half of it should be walking. It shouldn't, the majority of it shouldn't be sitting. And again, this comes down to the difference between ideas of uh, types of meditation and our idea that meditation is on the side of, of the cultivation of tranquility, which it isn't in a Buddhist perspective. That, that's not the goal. But it goes beyond just uh, physical health and sustainability. Walking meditation has benefits. It, it, it is beneficial for sitting meditation. But it's also beneficial for taking you away from a, um, an attachment or a dependency on calm. On, on a quiet mind. Walking meditation has the tendency to um, trigger a restlessness. And so it's a challenge. And it, it deals directly with your um, active mind. And so it's often something that a new meditator is not, um, not pleased to have to perform, there's an aversion often to it, because it's not as pleasant, as comfortable for some people as the sitting, for those who are attached to calm states. And so I, I think a, a, a practical and obvious benefit that becomes apparent is walking meditation helps free you from this attachment to the pleasure of sitting. I'm, it's most likely one of the reasons why we find ourselves in modern times unhealthy, uh, sitting, sitting to an extent that is unhealthy, is because it's, pleas it's pleasant. It's much more comfortable, much more relaxing. Uh, for, if, if you're lazy, sitting around, sitting, lounging comfortably is something, even if you're not lazy, it's something we do for pleasure. So it's something we do get attached to. Walking meditation breaks this up, and you see that this is quite practical, uh, quite uh, sorry, quite apparent from, um, in a in a very real sense. This isn't theoretical. You can see it, and you can uh, hear from meditators how it's uh, disruptive. It's challenging to have to do walking. It's un unpleasant even sometimes. Of course, it's not the walking that's unpleasant. It's the um, not getting what you want. As walking meditation is only valuable, really, for mindfulness practice, not for tranquility practice. So I thought um, it's w worth talking about these things, but also mentioning some of the ways in which uh, the Buddha discusses walking meditation. The first is this, that where in a intensive practice, he would say one should Spend, or one, one who is practicing properly will practice walking and sitting in alternation. Another place where the Buddha talks about walking is um, when he talks about the benefits of walking. And he lists five benefits. So he makes it quite clear that walking meditation has benefits. And four of them are mostly physical. The first one, well, the first two are actually interesting because they involve patience. The first one is the ability to walk long distances. The second is the ability to be patient with, with, with activities, with work, to be, just become a more patient person as a result of having to cultivate or to, to practice, engage in this monotonous practice of walking back and forth. It builds patience and it challenges you when you're restless, when you are bored, when you are displeased by having to walk back and forth. And it challenges us also to slow down. Uh, it challenges the mind uh, that seeks a goal because you have to shift from trying to get somewhere, and obviously you're not getting anywhere, you're just going to turn around and walk back, to being present. 
Um, the third benefit is it's good for sickness. The fourth is it's good for digestion. But the fifth is that the concentration that comes from mindful, from walking meditation, lasts a long time. That's how the Buddha described it. And you can think of it as benefiting you into the sitting meditation. But it's also quite um, unique and interesting in, uh, as a meditation practice because it, it's quick and it's coarse and, and it's uh, a very obvious object, a very um, apparent object to focus on the sensation of lifting the foot, the sensation of moving the foot, the sensation of placing the foot. These are experiences. And if you're new to mindfulness practice, it might not be readily apparent why that's important, but what we're trying to gain, remember, understanding, is based on familiarity. And it's not familiarity with some obscure reality that's not there. Familiarity with ordinary reality to get more familiar than we are. Our ordinary experience of things is very tangential. We experience something and then we react to it, we judge it, we extrapolate from it. We're very briefly engaged with reality and so we are not as familiar with our ordinary experiences as we think we are. When you gain a minute, moment by moment, detailed, direct, familiarity with reality, many things change about your perception of reality, of your own reality, your perception of your mind, your perception of right and wrong, good and bad. You gain clarity about the reasons why you're suffering, just because you're, you're watching, you're paying better attention. And walking meditation allows this because of each, because of the many moments of experience. It teaches you how to be present with experience and it teaches you about your mind when you are engaged with an experience. It shows you your reactions, it shows you your judgments, it shows you your cravings and your clingings and your distractions, and all the many habits in the mind it shows you. It shows you what, it, what is very important to see. Walking meditation is a great uh, introduction to living a mindful life because it, it provides an example of how to do something actively while being present. And it's not a, sh it's not a long, uh, it's not a leap to um, extrapolate it in this, the practice, the, the, the ideas of the practice into your daily life, where you then engage in mindful eating, mindful uh, working, mindful brushing of your teeth, and and uh, cleaning and so on, mindful of mindful showering, mindful urinating and defecating, <laughs> mindful life. There's another um, example of where walk mindfulness of walking is discussed, and it's not the words of the Buddha. We don't have a lot of detailed meditation. We don't have much much detailed meditation instruction in the suttas. There's some details, basic details about breath meditation. Um, but things like walking meditation, th there are no details on how to practice it. And yet, uh, or, uh, however, we, we have more details in the commentaries and the, the instruction manuals that were made by disciples of the Buddha and passed on by the Buddha and his disciples generation after generation. And, and they're still very ancient and can be considered quite valuable, if not authoritative. And so we have in the commentaries to the Satipatthana Sutta, for example, where they describe breaking the walking step into six parts. And we have words for it. The, the words in Pali are Udharana, Atiharana, Vitiharana, Vosajana, Sanikepana, Sanirumbana. And it describes these as like lifting the heel, lifting the foot, moving. And so we try to incorporate this into our practice even today. This is a very ancient idea, ancient practice. And this isn't something I'm, I'm saying that you should get into uh, without a teacher, but through a course, we will start a meditator at doing a simple step, simple foot movement, and then throughout the course, we'll instruct them to do 
a, a step with two parts and three parts and four. We we'll give those sorts of instructions as the meditator advances through the course. Best to be done with a teacher. And so if you're interested, and you can take one of the courses we, ha we offer, an at-home course. For those of you who have done it and are wondering, is, is this some newfangled, uh, modern take on Buddhism? And it's not. This is an, it, it, so this is interesting because it's not. It's, a, it's um, a, a practice that is very ancient. And the idea here is to be aware of individual experiences because the feelings of lifting the foot are different from the feelings of moving the foot. They're different experiences. And so this um, minute or, or, or uh, dissection of the walking step is very valuable in terms of giving you the precision and the, the clarity and the direct familiarity with reality. I mean, there's nothing special about any of the movements. It's just that that level of, of proficiency is very valuable in terms of cultivating a, a very direct familiarity with the nature of reality, which is ultimately just moments of experience arising and ceasing. And that familiarity is what lead, what frees you from uh, frees you from attachment to m mistaken attachment to what you thought was there to what you thought was real things that you thought were were stable satisfying controllable as reality is not stable not satisfying and not controllable and so objects can never be a source of satisfaction a source of peace Peace and happiness have to come from independence. And of course, sitting meditation is uh, equally valuable in terms of watching, say, the stomach rising and ceasing to give you that familiarity with, or, or rising and falling, to give you that familiarity with reality. But don't discount walking meditation. It's a very valuable practice and has a lot of good qualities. If nothing else, just to provide a good counterpart to sitting meditation. And so... When we practice, we always do walking followed by sitting. And these are some of the reasons and some of the ideas behind that. So thank you for listening.